than me. So Professor Gazard will be the next to speak up. And he will tell us about a very important and very complicated problem of the uh, closure angle, glaucoma monitoring, about all those controversies we face today. The floor is yours. You're welcome. Don't be in a hurry. Good morning, everyone. Dobri Utra. Um, and thank you very much indeed for the... Is that right? Thank you very much indeed for the invitation to speak. I'm going to speak this morning about some of the changes and developments and existing controversies in the management of angle closure glaucoma, um, touching specifically and mainly on laser treatment and the timing of various different laser treatments <laughs> in the different subsets and specific subtypes of angle closure glaucoma drawing on some of the recent um, randomized controlled trials that have been published in the last couple of years. Um, no specific competing interests for me of note for this presentation. I'm going to try and touch upon quite a lot of areas, so excuse me if these are briefly mentioned. Clear lens extraction, for whom and when. Uh, iridotomy after the report of the EAGLE trial, where you put that iridotomy if you do decide to do one, Iridoplasty, whether we should do that at all and for whom. Occasionally mentioning, a brief mention of diode laser for acute angle closure and where that fits in, and then SLT in angle closure, should we be doing that at all, and is there an evidence base? We are talking about um, iridotrabecular contact, um, with contact between the iris and the trabecular meshwork. The Requirement for all patients for diagnosis, even with beautiful anterior segment imaging, remains gonioscopy. We need to be able to identify the corneal wedge on gonioscopy, the point at which the corneal epithelial and endothelial lines join, identify that wedge, and know that beyond that, the structures that we can see are trabecular meshwork. We need to be able to uh, diagnose those patients in whom we can't see structures beyond the corneal wedge, in whom, therefore, there is iridotrabecular contact. And previously, in the past, we have recommended iridotomy for those cases that had 180 degrees of closure on dark room gonioscopy without indentation. For the moment, that remains the case for those patients who have normal pressures. We need to... Could you just click on the video so that it runs? Thank you. We need to be able to do this in the dark because iridotrabecular contact changes very, very rapidly and exquisitely with illumination levels. You can get angle, a closed angle and then bring the room lights up and the angle will open. This is an old UVM video just showing how readily and how rapidly the iridotrabecular contact reverses and how reversible angle closure can be in some patients. We need to remember our terms and diagnoses and definitions. Mm -hmm. Primary angle closure suspects are those in whom there is that 180 degrees of iridotrabecular contact, but there's normal pressure and no peripheral anterior synechiae. That progresses on to angle closure, which is the presence of raised pressure above the normal level and or peripheral anterior synechiae, i.e. abnormal adhesions between the iris and the trabecular meshwork. And then some of that will progress in time to raised pressure and thereby angle closure glaucoma. And it will do that through a number of different mechanisms. The narrow angle can cause synechial or appositional closure, or with occasional intermittent contact between those two structures can cause trabecular meshwork damage, all of which can then impair aqueous outflow, either temporarily, acutely, or chronically, that can then lead to glaucoma dysoptic neuropathy. So having defined the terms, we can go to some of our source material. The international and European guidelines for angle closure are now out of date because they do not currently incorporate the findings of the EAGLE trial or of three big trials that have come out of Singapore. So they're very useful for terminology, but we have to be careful to, um, about updating these for our guidelines for treatment. A lot of the comments that we have about angle closure, particularly in Europe, is that it's mainly a disease of the Far East, and that's clearly not true. Even looking at the data of um, existing prevalence studies, there's at least around about half a percent in the over 40s have angle closure glaucoma. Many more than that 
will have primary angle closure or be primary angle closure suspects. So the whole group of primary angle closure disease is much more common than we previously thought. That's been reflected in the increased incidence of angle closure diagnoses. This is just figures for the UK from our hospital statistics, which are based around an increased uptake of gonioscopy, increased frequency and accuracy of gonioscopy, and it's been diagnosed much more often than the last decade. That's reflected in a much greater uptake of laser iridotomy in the last decade. The inflection in that curve is round about 2002, when a number of us came back from the Far East and were lecturing widely on the techniques of gonioscopy. The practice of gonioscopy in the UK and in England particularly changed, and a lot more angle closure disease was diagnosed. So the disease is much more frequent than we previously realized. What are we doing with an iridotomy? Well, we're obviously reversing pupil block, removing the pressure differential across the iris, and hopefully opening up the angle in a proportion of cases. The angle opens. We're doing that with either a pure YAG, which is probably the majority of your patients with fair eyes, blue eyes, Northern European and Russian patients. In some of our patients in London with much darker eyes, Indian patients, African patients, East Asian patients, Chinese patients, we're using sequential argon and then YAG in order to pre-treat the patient so that we can reduce the amount of YAG energy that we're using. But getting a decent uh, minimum 200 micron circumferentially enlarged iridotomy to give us enough opening to reduce that pressure differential. One of the concerns that's been discussed recently a lot in the literature has been dysphotopsia. If you ask patients whether or not they get abnormal um, positive visual symptoms after the laser iridotomy, a significant proportion of patients do. One large, um, significantly powered randomized controlled trial has specifically looked at that, although there are now two trials that disagree. George Spaeth's study first really brought this to attention that showed that partially covered iridotomies, a quarter of patients with partially covered iridotomies were having troublesome visual symptoms. Ike Ahmed nicely showed um, with some diagrams from anterior segment OCT that it seemed to be the prismatic effect of the um, tear film prism at the meniscus with the upper eyelid that seemed to be bending like through those um, peripherally placed but not completely covered iridotomies. He did a trial on the basis of that, particularly looking at linear dysphotopsia, and showed that a proportion of patients with troublesome symptoms was less if you placed a temporal laser iridotomy. The problem with that is that you do get more pain. In our hands, we're getting more hemorrhage if you do a temporal iridotomy, and there are longer iris processes at that point. So a number of those iridotomies are posteriorly obscured. We're not sure if they're ever obstructed, but they are certainly obscured by long ciliary processes lying behind the iridotomy. So what is my current practice and what most of us at Moorfields are doing is where it is fully covered with a reasonable lid position, we're still doing some superior iridotomies, but we're going to temporal iridotomies where there is a risk of partial exposure. However, we are probably doing fewer iridotomies as of this year because of the EAGLE trial. So I'd like to share, you the result, share with you the results of the EAGLE trial, where we looked at angle closure glaucoma patients with glaucomatous optic neuropathy defined by disc or field, or primary angle closure with normal nerves but high pressure. So they were significant at-risk patients or patients who already had damage. They were randomized to clear lens extraction or laser iridotomy. So they had to have high pressure, they had to have 180 degrees of iridotrabecular contact on dark room gonioscopy without indentation. They were newly diagnosed with no prior iridotomy, and they were over 50, so they were effectively presbyopic, and they had no cataract. We looked at quality of life outcome measures, pressures, and cost. There were 400 participants from around the world, and we allowed for a 15% loss to follow up. The EQ5D is a quality of life measure that showed a significantly but small impact on increased quality of life for those individuals who had had clear lens extraction, phaco emulsification. More interesting was the pressure was lower in the um, phaco group, but this is on treatment. 
When you look at the number of medications that were, were required to control the intraocular pressures at three years after their primary treatment, a much higher proportion of those would drop free without medication. Having started off with either glaucoma or pressures over 30, 60% would drop free compared to those who'd had a laser iridotomy. So we're clearly having a profound effect of lens extraction, which is what we see with cataract surgery all the time, but these are clear lens extractions. A number of those that went on to have further surgery, well, in the PI group, there were 16 lens extractions because they had uncontrolled intraocular pressure, and of course, a number of those had them for cataract, uh, for visual reasons, for visual acuity reasons, reduced vision. They also had a much greater number of trabeculectomies and a small number, one, one each had an eye stent in the tube. There was no visual field difference between the two groups, as you would expect, because these were being actively treated for their pressure. There were a small number of surgical complications, including, in fact, one dislocated lens from the iridotomy group. But they were small, and they were thought not to be significant. This was cost-effective on the basis of UK cost analyses and what our government will pay for. So the EAGLE trial showed that clear lens extraction in individuals who are at risk with high pressure or existing glaucoma was a cost-effective, quality-of-life-improving intervention with a better intraocular pressure outcome. So that is substantially changing practice in the UK and around the world, so more people are doing clear lens extractions for patients over 50. It comes with a caveat, with a warning. These are patients at high risk. They're not the low-risk patients. These are patients with high pressure. And these are patients who are over 50, so they were presbyopic. They are not losing significant accommodation. The concern that we have to bear in mind with all lens extractions and angle closures that are specific angle closure concerns and issues around phacoemulsification in angle closure disease because the risk increases exponentially with reducing axial length. So we're making measurements of the axial length before finally deciding on which course of action to go. For the very short eye, we're also measuring the posterior scleral thickness with, with ultrasound. So we're measuring before we're deciding because that may well tip our um, decision to doing an initial iridotomy rather than lens extraction despite the results of that trial because for the very, very short eyes, the surgical risks are greater. You have all the standard risks of surgical complications but more. They often have floppy irises perhaps because of um, episodes of <coughs> acute angle closure in the past. There is well known to be a higher, a, a lower rate of um, lower corneal endothelial cell counts in angle closure eyes. We know that they have a greater rate of zonul zonular weakness. Whether that's causing the angle closure or due to the angle closure, no one knows. But given the strong interactions between pseudo exfoliation, that's a significant concern. And then, of course, cystoid macular edema and refractive surprises are higher in these short eyes. So we have to be careful. And then there's the very much the feared risk of aqueous misdirection. So what are we going to consider when we're considering whether or not to follow the results of this randomized controlled trial? Well, it's all the usual concerns. Um, are, have they already had an iridotomy? Is their IOP controlled or uncontrolled at this time? How much post-iridotomy, if they've had one, closure remains? What's the severity of their glaucoma, the surgical risk? There is a significant number of benefits with specifically with ang angle closure for removal of a lens, but there are significant greater risks. So it becomes a much more complex uh, risk-benefit analysis and surgical decision. But I think the results of the EAGLE trial are such that, following on from this, we're going to clearly be taking out almost any visually significant cataract in any angle closure disease. We're going to be considering a clear or near-clear lens extraction in anyone who's got angle closure glaucoma as a primary intervention. If they've already had a PI, we may well be going on to do lens extraction if they've got raised pressure. For those who only have raised pressure, clear lens extraction is a primary intervention. Post-LPI closure, if they've had a PI in the past and they're presbyopic, well, when they get raised intraocular pressure, particularly for the hyperopes, then generally speaking, I'm taking out their lenses and they're appreciating that. We're avoiding medical treatment for those groups and we're giving them a, greater, a better refractive outcome. <coughs> but for the primary angle closure suspects, which are a large number of individuals because of the pyramid of, of frequency and prevalence rates, a very high prevalence rate of pure PACS, 
So those are the ones with closure, but normal pressures. Those are still having a laser irodotomy. And sometimes they're having a clear lens extraction, perhaps if they are presbyopic and hypermetropic, and they've still got some closure, but with a little bit more caution. Pupil block and relief of pupil block, however, is not the only story. So moving on now from a discussion of clear lens extraction in angle closure, I'm going to talk a little bit about iridoplasty in the context of iridoplasty. And we're going to talk about plateau iris syndrome. That's a subset of angle closure disease. I think, of, I think really of primary angle closure disease in its broadest sense. And then plateau iris is a di diagnosis that we're making after we have relieved pupil block. If you haven't previously done an iridotomy or in some cases a lens extraction, then it's going to be difficult to make that diagnosis because you have um, pupil block and iris bombay obscuring the picture. There are lots of different ways that we can get iridotrabecular contact, persistent angle closure after um, iridotomy. You can get very prominent last iris rolls. You can get thick peripheral iris. You can get classic plateaus. There are lots of historical definitions, but ultimately... Rich's definition that it was an occludable angle on gonioscopy with a flat iris plane and a relatively central deep anterior chamber, I think, holds true. We've got configuration and syndrome. Configuration is just where you have that iris in that shape, but syndrome is where you truly get the closure. And then we have to consider whether there's raised pressure or glaucoma. Um, Herming Guan showed that this was particularly prominent in small eyes with small angle dimensions, a very anterior iris insertion, thick irises, an anterior ins anteriorly inserted ciliary body. And all of those can give you crowding, crowding of the angle after a laser irodotomy. And what you see is you may think, well, is that really that common? Plateau iris in its pure form is relatively rare, isn't it? Well, if you start looking, at, looking for it, you'll see a lot more of it. The mechanism of classic plateau, the classic, cl classic plateau configuration is because the, the, the peripheral anterior ciliary processes are sitting very anteriorly and holding that peripheral iris forward. And you're getting that angulation of the peripheral iris, pushing it up into the angle, pushing the iris up against the trabecular meshwork, giving you iridotrabecular contact. In Asian disease, you more often, often see a, a flat iris plane after an iris iridotomy but with a very prominent fold of iris tucked away in that angle such that you don't have contact between the anterior ciliary processes, but you still get that anterior angulation of the peripheral iris. It probably doesn't matter which the mechanism is, but it's just worth knowing that there are multiple mechanisms. You do not need to be doing UBM to make this diagnosis. This can all be diagnosed on gonioscopy. But what's important is to do gonioscopy after you've done an iridotomy. It's important to do gonioscopy after you've done the lens extraction because some patients don't even open up despite clear lens extraction. And if you don't do the gonioscopy, you won't know. The prevalence rates, with a certain uh, definition, are remarkably high. In some studies, 30% after irodotomy of primary angle closure suspects with normal pressure still had significant iridotrabecular contact due to this sort of configuration. In Asian angle closure, 30% of, 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 of angle closure glaucoma had residual iridotrabecular contact. contact. In non-glaucomatous eyes, one study found that around a fifth of patients could be diagnosed as having an, a, a, a plateau-type configuration. So just having that sort of shape doesn't necessarily mean treatment. And not all iridotrabecular contact is necessarily this sort of pure <coughs> plateau configuration. We need to look for a double hump sign on gonioscopy. And we need to consider what the background of our patients are. So we've got multiple causes of non-pupil block mechanisms. We've got multiple ways in which you can get residual appositional closure. And the rates can vary depending on how you look for it. Historically, people have been very uh, tempted to intervene and treat that, but I've, as I hope I've shown you, with rates of 25 to 30% of patients still having some degree of closure despite an iridotomy, the risk is that we'd be over-treating our patients. So although Bob Rich in the 90s was treating everyone 
with iridotracheal contact, and even in the UK, some people were doing that. We've moved away from that now. The peripheral argon laser iridoplasty now is probably, when you look at the risks and benefits, something that we shouldn't be doing for most of our patients, however much we want to intervene, because of the complication. Not just the pain and the discomfort, but also the inflammation, and specifically an increase in peripheral anterior sinicae. And patients' vision can change, and you can alter and affect and harm their visual function because of effects on pupil, because of effects on accommodation. You can worsen their anterior sinicae, and in an audit of results, when we were doing a lot of iridoplasties at Moorfields around a decade ago, a half of those eyes who had any PAS before the iridoplasty got worse. On the back of that, a randomized controlled trial in Singapore in Asian eyes compared iridoplasty in patients with raised pressure and glaucoma who'd had an iridotomy, and they compared it to medical treatment. And they found that although there were some effects from the argon laser iridoplasty, that actually simply treating them with latanoprost did better. And they really, they really were better off having latanoprost than having an iridoplasty. And worse than that, that they were, um, some of them were actually getting worse with the iridoplasty. So is there a role for iridoplasty anywhere in our practice? Well, Dennis Lamb's study of argon laser iridoplasty for acute angle closure is very powerful. A number of patients don't respond to pilocarpin and diamox for acute angle closure crises. So moving on to a different setting now, the patient who comes in with a very high pressure, acute angle closure attack, those patients in our, medic in, in our hospital will have iridotomy, sorry, will have a late, um, pilocarpin, diamox, and if they don't respond within an hour to a lower pressure, they will go on to have an acute peripheral argon laser iridoplasty. Half a second exposure, 500 micron um, burn size through 180 degrees to break the acute attack. And Dennis Lamb's randomized controlled trial showed very nicely that the pressure comes down very rapidly with a laser iridoplasty. He was doing it for everybody. We reserve it to those patients who don't respond to medical treatment initially. Paul Chu from Singapore also showed that if you do that for your patients, you see a, a greater angle opening, <coughs> excuse me, you see a greater angle opening in the short to medium term. To be honest, all of our acute attacks, the majority are going to have their lenses removed probably within two to three months anyway. So this, this effect on angle opening that persists at three months is probably less important, but it's interesting to know that it persists. I think the questions we still need to ask ourselves, we're talking about controversies here, the questions we still need to ask ourselves about plateau iris is, well, does the IOP need treating in it with any particular patient? Does the anatomy need treating, or can we just treat the pressure? Will resolution of that iridotropecular contact actually improve the pressure control? And if we, if we can do that, if we can achieve that by some mechanism, are we potentially going to preserve some long-term function with the trabecular meshwork, which will, will improve the long-term, the five to 10-year outcome for these patients? So when are we treating it with anything more than um, iridotomy? Well, I'm considering how severe the iridotrabecular contact is, the extent of it, the extent of any peripheral anterior sinicae, uh, what they've had in the past, uh, particularly the severity of the glaucoma to subtic neuropathy. Some patients are still getting um, elective iridoplasty in our clinic, but much smaller numbers than previously. Any uh, limited plateau I'm only ever observing now. We may consider iridoplasty for extensive plateau, even without high raised intraocular pressure, but we really are only treating patients who've got raised um, intraocular pressure these days, following Ong Tin's um, paper showing that there is, there is some evidence of some harm for some patients. And of course, they're getting lens extraction for the slightest cataract. Very few patients tolerate pilocarpin, but a few like it. In some patients, that's simply not going to work, and they simply need lens extraction to open up their angle. So I've talked a little bit about clear lens extraction versus iridotomy. I've talked about iridoplasty and its role in managing angle closure glaucoma. I've talked a little bit about iridoplasty in, man in managing acute angle closure glaucoma. Complete change now. We're going to have to slightly recalibrate our focus now on selective laser trabecular plasty for chronic angle closure. Now, for years, people said, don't do laser trabecular plasty in angle closure because you'll make them worse. And for argon laser trabecular plasty, that is true. 
because you're going to give them peripheral anterior synechia. So please don't go around doing ALT for angle closure patients with narrow angles because I think you will get, make them worse. It causes too much focal localized inflammation and the iris will just stick to the angle. But for selective laser trabecular plasty, which is less inflammatory, I think it's very interesting that there does seem to be a role. And originally, there was just a pilot study that suggested that it was safe. What's interesting now is that there are now randomized controlled trials comparing significant numbers of patients with a prostaglandin analog. And again, a study from um, the Far East showing that there were significant um, rates of reduced intraocular pressure with SLT. Now, admittedly, the, um, the prostaglandin analog, in this case, Traviprost group, had better pressure lowering, but of course all the advantages of SRT in patients who have already had either an iridotomy or lens extraction, the advantage of an SRT is of course you don't have to worry about patient compliance, you don't have to worry about whether or not the patient is actually going to take your drug. So we're very specifically focusing on patients who've already had their pupil block treated, they've had either an iridotomy or lens extraction, and now they have raised intraocular pressure. And for those patients, for that group, I think SLT is, in angle closure, now a justifiable, valid, uh, potential um, course of action. Their results showed that complete success rates, as I said, were higher for the prostaglandin analogs, the qualified success rates <coughs> similarly, and a significant number of patients were doing well in both groups. So SLT, not as powerful as a prostaglandin, but cer certainly a valid treatment alternative in angle closure disease. There were very small numbers of pressure spikes. There were some people concerned about SLT in angle closure disease because they thought the rate of pressure spikes might be higher. There are still people saying that SLT doesn't work in angle closure. That's clearly wrong. So if you hear them say that, ignore them. Because when you, when you see this trial um, from Ong Tin's group, they're a very nice study showing that you can get a significant response rate. Not as high a response rate as in primary treated ocular hypertension or primary treatment of primary open angle glaucoma. It's not as good as in POAG, but it is a valid treatment. So for their discussion, they had few side effects. It was safe. There were reasonable success rates. They weren't doing it for severe cases of angle closure glaucoma because clearly they're going to need something else on top. So I hope that I've managed to cover some of when to do and when not to do clear lens extraction for the angle closure disease, primary angle closure with pressures over 30. Iridotomy in the post-eagle age for primary angle closure suspects and lower pressure patients with PAC and anyone who refuses surgery, of which they're a significant group. And of course, probably the younger patients are still having iridotomies, not clear lens extraction. I have a significant number of iridotomies in patients who are under 50. Iridoplasty is being reserved for the resistant treatment acute disease, some plateau iris, but probably not primary angle closure glaucomas. We haven't really touched upon cyclodiode, but I'm using that for treatment resistant acute angle closure where they've already had an iridoplasty. So that's a really, sorry, and then SLT for in angle closure where they've had an iridotomy or um, lens extraction, perhaps as a second line treatment where they're failing their first line drop or perhaps of those patients who are going to be unable or unwilling to take the medication on a regular basis. So I hope that that's managed to cover some of the changes in practice that have crept in over the last uh, two to five years to clarify some of those areas. I hope I haven't sown too much confusion from uh, the specific subtypes of angle closure because it has got more complicated in the last few years because we can now do different things for different groups of patients with different levels of risk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a very brilliant presentation. A lot of information, very difficult information, complicated information. I would like to ask two questions if possible. And I'm sure majority of us already have very similar questions. 
And please, colleagues, do not hesitate. Please approach the microphone. Let's stick to the international practice. Don't write some stupid notes on the papers. Please introduce yourself openly and ask the question. I have two questions to ask. What is the place in the treatment of close angle glaucoma is trabeloctomy? I would like to comment to say that currently we received very interesting data in our own link on SLT in case of uh, uh, ACG. We have pretty large experience of SLT, selective laser trabeculoplasty for 10 years. We analyzed patients with different forms and we found out that the efficacy in terms of pressure drop and in terms of glaucoma stabilization in case of ACG after SLT or after the cataract extraction, lens extraction, or after the iridotomy, it appeared to be on the second line after the primary open angle glaucoma plug higher in the pseudo exfoliative and higher than in pigment. So that's a difference. And I think that's totally novel approach and it's just started to be started. And I'm very happy that today it was covered. So that was my comment. And now my two questions to Professor Gazard. What is the place of trabeloctomy in the treatment of close angle glaucoma? That's my first question. Trabeloctomy in the treatment of close angle glaucoma. Do you perform it now or not? What are the indications? Thank you. I still am having to do trabeculectomies for closed angle glaucoma, but I am now doing them after they've had a lens extraction. I almost every patient with angle closure glaucoma and uncontrolled pressure that I am now treating has a lens extraction first. They may have had lens extraction at the beginning of their treatment course, or they may have come to me already on medication, but still with a lens, still phacic. And if their pressure is uncontrolled, then they're having a lens extraction, with the warning that they may need a later trabeculectomy. One of the concerns for that patient group is with severe angle closure and, a, and, and lens extraction, the worry that either the pressure will not be low enough and the effect will not be great enough, or that the surgery itself will be damaging. And I think one thing that has radically changed recently is that co the combination of lens extraction for the very severe cases with minimally invasive glaucoma surgery, whether that is an eye strength, a hydrus implant, a trabectome, or, or any of those angle-type surgeries, in themselves they are not enough to treat severe disease. They're for mild disease. But in combination with lens extraction in angle closure in severe cases, it is surprising how many patients get well-controlled intraocular pressure in the end of that. And if they do not, they've safely um, got over the, the, the period of the lens extraction. And then for a small proportion of those that are still uncontrolled, they can then have trabeculectomy later on. So it's, it's really a course of treatment starting off with a, a clear lens extraction for the badly affected, plus or minus drops as required. For those who fail that, then they may well go on to trabeculectomy. Or if they come to me with an iridotomy on meds, then they're having a clear lens extraction or cataract extraction with or without MIG surgery. And then, and only then if that fails, are they having trabeculectomy? Because I think we have to remember that the, the complications of trabeculectomy in these uh, angle closure cases are, are somewhat higher than they are for pure open angle disease. But I'm still doing a lot of traps for angle closure because there are a lot of severe cases that for, that, for which that's not enough. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Very interesting and important comment for us. And now my second question. It's not a question even. Once again, I would like Professor to emphasize for our audience to repeat slowly once again that laser iridectomy is performed in patients who yet not have closed angle glaucoma, who have uh, simply primary angle close that is simply seen in gonioscopy. That's it. Maybe not everyone understands that because because everyone is waiting till glaucoma comes, till glaucoma comes. But this is very important aspect because very many patients with already closed angle who we can help timely with yet without glaucoma and they will never have glaucoma. Do I have the correct comment of your lecture, Professor? Uh, yes, I think that's, that's true. The, the interesting group is the patient who sits in front of you who has angle closure in the clinic but has normal pressure in the clinic. And it is a mistake to think that that patient 
has normal pressure outside of the clinic. They are getting a large number of those patients who have normal pressure in front of you but a closed angle on gonioscopy will be having intermittent pressure spikes outside of the clinic. And those patients need a laser iridotomy to prevent them from developing angle closure later. If they already have high pressure, already have, already have glaucoma, then it's an easy decision because the damage is already done. But for that group where they have normal pressure in front of you and significant iridotrabecular contact, significant angle closure, a preventative laser iridotomy can save their sight. Now, in some patients, that becomes a more nuanced, a more balanced, difficult decision because iridotomy can be difficult in some eyes. I suspect that all of the patients you are treating probably have blue eyes and an easy iridotomy, which is very, very safe. And therefore, in those cases, my threshold for treatment is very, very low. Is that fair? Absolutely. Thank you very much, colleagues. Any other questions, comments, remarks on that issue, on that brilliant presentation? And I would like to ask Professor Loskutov to comment on that. Presentation. It's a lot of things clear now concerning the eye with the angle closure. But if we have a symptoms, it's as small as clear. But contralateral eye, which you have, may have no symptoms at all, mm -hmm. are there any special interest in it? Are there any special prophylactic activity in your practice? Okay, if I think it's possible. I think there are t two important components to, to the answer there. One is about symptoms and one is about the contralateral eye. Interestingly, I mentioned symptoms only once in the context of the um, acute angle closure crisis where the patient has a very high pressure with a red eye and pressures of over 40, the really acute attack. Generally speaking, symptoms don't form a large part of my diagnosis. I'm making the diagnosis on the basis of gonioscopy dark room gonioscopy with no indentation, with a high magnification lens, and that, and that alone. Because symptoms are very unreliable. Our patients are not good at knowing whether their headache or their blurred vision or their dazzle or glare comes from angle closure or whether it comes from something else. And all of the studies on symptoms show that they're unreliable. In terms of the patient with clear symptoms, and clearly some patients do have clear symptoms and require treatment, I am always treating the fellow eye. Very, very rarely is the eye so asymmetric that they do not need treatment in both eyes. So anyone who has got um, a symptomatic eye with angle closure or even an eye with diagnosed angle closure in one eye, the threshold for treating the other eye is very, very low. An acute attack eye, every fellow eye needs treatment regardless because you don't know what whether the underlying mechanism is, is, is a bilateral mechanism, it usually is. So diagnose on the basis of gonioscopy. Be careful about using symptoms that the patient may be having outside of the clinic as a guide because they can be misleading. But if, they are, if you are treating one eye because of acute attack or because of symptomatic disease, then certainly I would be treating the fellow eye with a prophylactic preventive laser iridotomy in almost every single case. Thank you. Uh, if, you if it's possible, one more question. You have uh, mentioned that, uh, prostaglandins yes. and uh, prostaglandins analog in the situation which is a uh, rigid IOP, cannot stay our uh, heart quiet. And so uh, are there any options uh, besides the prostaglandins analog? Are there any options for the beta blockers or symbiotomimetics or other groups of um, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors or any other medications or just a prostaglandins and all Absolutely. I think, I, think the whole I think the whole range of medical treatment is, is, is viable and valid. I mentioned prostaglandins twice because they were the control arm in two randomized controlled trials. They were chosen as the control arm in those two randomized controlled trials because they are the first line treatment, the first line medical treatment for all of our glaucoma patients. So everyone as first line has latanoprost in the UK almost without exception because it's cheap and it's effective and it's safe. But certainly for angle closure, uh, it's cheap in the UK. Um, 
but for angle closure, I would be using any of the four major classes of drugs. I rarely have patients on long-term pilocarpine, very rarely. But some patients do benefit from it. Some patients even like it because of the increased depth of field, but rarely. What was funny, the, 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 the cheap bit or the safe bit? Some more questions coming. Please introduce yourself. You see your discussion made our audience very excited. Dear Professor, I'm doctor, ophthalmic surgeon from the First City Hospital, Moscow. I have a question to ask. We very frequently face very challenging cases in case of long-standing acute attacks of glaucoma when there are resistant edemas of retina and when iridectomy does not help. So how to mm, remove, how to perform cataract extraction in such resistant retina edemas? Thank you. Yeah, thanks. thanks. Um, Corneal, sorry. Um, in cases where the pressure is still high, um, if they've had an iridotomy, they will off, I will, we will usually be doing an argon laser iridoplasty to try and lower the pressure. We will then often, if the pressure remains high and we still think that they are in an acute attack, they will often be having an acute cyclodiode laser in one or two quadrants in an effort to break the attack. It depends on how chronic the attack has been. If it's been for a few days, iridoplasty, then diode. I do advocate early lens extraction for angle, acute angle closure disease. And I had a randomized controlled trial that I set up in Singapore looking at very early lens extraction. The problem was that the surgeons in that trial were very, very, very experienced surgeons doing very, very difficult cases. And I think the problem from extrapolating from that trial, in the trial, the lens extraction cases did very, very well. They had a much lower rate of trabeculectomy at two years. And Dennis Lamb did a similar study of primary lens extraction for acute angle closure, where they had a much lower, uh, much better pressure control at two years. So I think lens extraction early after acute angle closure is a good idea, but if they have severe corneal edema, then the lens extraction, phaco emulsification can be incredibly challenging. And in an, in an effort to stabilize the eye, to get it better controlled, to get that surgery safer, an initial iridoplasty, plus or minus an early di cyclodiode laser, um, I think can usually get you in a better status and a better position to do the lens extraction. Now, some of those cases are still going to be very, very, have very edematous corneas, and I think then you have a real problem because then you really don't have a sufficient view to see the lens and do the surgery. And in our experience, those cases are relatively few, fortunately, by the time you've done both lasers, all three lasers. Thank you very much. I hope you are satisfied with your answer. Dear colleagues, currently 215 participants have been registered and we are getting some questions from the online. And we have very Russian, typical Russian question. Do we have to perform gonioscopy in order to identify all these cases? So now doctor starts to understand that gonioscopy is very serious. So we have two questions. We just discussed it with my colleague that possibly uh, we need to perform gonioscopy more frequently. The sense is that if we perform gonioscopy very frequently to all glaucoma patients, that we will never reach the point when there is a long-standing attack, uh, corneal edema, and we don't know what to do, how to treat this particular case. That is why I'm very grateful to Professor Gazard that he draw our attention to that particular challenge. It is very serious problem. Um, ankle closed glaucoma is much more significant than we used to think, and the problem is even more serious than the treatment of simply primary open angle glaucoma. And I'm very extremely grateful, and I hope we will continue this discussion in the second interactive part when I will announce you the results of the international survey on the monitoring of the uh, angle closure glaucoma. So, dear colleagues, now we need to make a break because we need to have tests, uh, audio tests 
this with uh, remote experts. So please enjoy some coffee, let's have some rest, and please welcome back in 25 minutes, exactly at 1 p.m. Moscow time. Welcome back, we proceed, thank you. So right now we are waiting for our colleagues to take the seats. So we are ready to answer some questions because online we are getting many questions from different regions. And right now I will give floor to Andrea to read the questions and we will decide who the experts will be answering. So we have some personal questions. Uh, first to Professor Gaz Gazard, what is your attitude to the anterior chamber puncture? With further jack laser iridectomy or phacomulsification of the cataract in patients with acute attack of closed angle glaucoma in the emergency hospitalization with uh, pronounced uh, uh, corneal edema and slit like chamber. Thank you. I think the problem with um, anterior chamber paracentesis in these eyes is that they are is that it is very difficult to do safely because you have a very thin slit-like anterior chamber almost by definition. You have uh, a difficult view almost by definition because those are the cases where you might consider it. And the patient is in pain, so it is not an easy thing to be doing safely and there is a significant risk of lens puncture with these cases and a very, very rapid decompression of the eye with all the potential risks of that. So um, certainly in more fields in our hands at the moment, we are advocating medical treatment first. For treatment resistant cases, we are then advocating acute peripheral argon laser iridoplasty through 180 or 360 degrees. And then for the very rare case that does not respond to that, then they are having acute cyclodiode laser. Now I am aware that there are people who are um, presenting widely that anterior chamber paracentesis um, is their treatment of choice. Uh, that, that is not our experience because we're concerned about the side effects. If I were in a situation where I had no access to laser, that is rare, but it can happen, if I had no access to laser and the pressure was still high, then I might consider that. With a very oblique paracentesis heading towards six o'clock, such that the tip of the needle was never going to be in front of the, or near the lens. And rather than using a blade or a large needle, an insulin syringe, which would in, in our terminology be a 30 gauge, very, very thin uh, needle attached to a syringe with the plunger removed, passed into the eye obliquely. Now that is not something that I have had to do because I have always had uh, access to um, a laser to perform an iridoplasty and it is very rare that acute argon laser iridoplasty does not work. So it is something that can be done. I, I generally speaking would rather it weren't done. Uh, thank you.